On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, it's the October 25th, 2021 edition of What the Ship Is Going On, the top five stories in the maritime news sector. I am your host, Sal McCaglano, Chair of the Department of History, Criminal Justice, and Political Science here at beautiful Campbell University in North Carolina, wearing my Campbell uh, shirt here today for you. Uh, former merchant mariner and instructor in courses in maritime history, maritime security, and maritime industry policy. So I have put together the top five news stories in the maritime news for you. And I got to say, this was a tough one. There is a lot going on. And one of the things we keep seeing here is more and more stories and events that are impacting the maritime sector. So let's take you over to story number one. So story number one has got to be obviously the shipping issue and the looming problems we're having in delays in getting cargo across. But what this all translates and the reason why this should be of concern to everybody is that we're going to start seeing inflation. We're going to start seeing higher prices. And, and whether you coax it in, it, it's higher shipping costs, whatever it is, it's inflation. If things cost more for you to get, that's inflation. And shipping costs are very reflective at this. This story by Greg Miller over at Freight Waves is a great one because as he says right here, shipping costs are way up more than you think. Costs are not just about raised rates, but as service quality plummets, effective inflation goes even higher. Greg does a great job with this. And one of the things he starts talking about here is, is that basically the, the quality is starting to fall. We're seeing, you know, we had a brief little dip here in some rates. People were talking about the rates plateauing, but still this, this the average index, the, the Fredo's Baltic Dry Index, which is from China to the West Coast of the United States, has been holding, you know, fairly steady. There's been some little dips down, but really around $17,000 to, to haul a, a FEU, a, a 40 foot equivalent unit across. Again, Go back to this time last year, it's 2,000 to 2,500. Go back two years ago, it's 1,000 something. And so we're seeing that cost just increase. This one, I see a couple of great charts in here. And I, I always love Greg for, for doing this stuff. These are for some earlier stories, but again, bring them back, use them. They're really good. Talks about reliability, the reliability of carriers. In other words, how reliable are they to get your cargo to you? And you look 2018, 2019, you're talking about 70, 80% reliability. Then in 2020, it just nosedives until you get into 2021. And we're seeing the lowest levels, just over 30% reliability. Average delays for uh, late vessel arrivals is increasing exponentially. Anchorage off, off LA Long Beach, over 80 vessels. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more here. Route performance and shipping prices from Yanatan. I'm mean, again, you're, you're seeing this right here. The, uh, the shipping prices are going up and then the performance is going down. I, I mean, that's what we're seeing right here. And he calls it shadow inflation because that's a New York Times term they're using, but it's inflation. It doesn't matter if it's shadow or not, it is, it is inflation. Uh, and you know, he uses the example here of Lay's potato chips, uh, where all of a sudden you start charging more. I mean, one of the things we see happen is they charge more for, sorry, my phone going off. Uh, they start charging more for goods, but they decrease the amount of goods in them. And so we're definitely seeing this. And so we're seeing it across the entire spectrum here. Whole story goes into it. And some ancillary stories that deal with this too is we're seeing in ports of China as a container news story, we're seeing growth in their box volumes. And what was that translate to? A looming Christmas crisis as congestion hits all these ports around the world. So Christmas is endangered, that's story number one. Oh, and it may cost more. Story number two is the fire on board the container ship Zim Kingston off the port of Victoria in British Columbia. So did a video yesterday, myself and John Conrad. I apologize, number one, for a early version of that video that extremely poor audio quality, I apologize. So one of the reasons I try to raise some money on Patreon is to get the right equipment. And one of the things I desperately need, obviously, is a sound equalizer. So, you know, if you contribute to the, uh, the, the, the page, that's what your money is going to. I'm also getting a new microphone here, should be here today for my office to improve audio quality on the videos I do here in my office. But anyway, Zim Kingston fire, really a significant fire. The result of, the reason for that fire isn't so much poor hazardous material storage, it's because this vessel lost a large series of containers 
during passage through what is known as a bomb cyclone. Uh, this is the huge weather area that's hitting the West Coast right now. And John and I go in some real detail talking about this and also the issue that this may have down in the anchorages in LA and Long Beach. Those vessels cannot stay there if they're gonna have a high wet wind event. Uh, we already saw what happened in the last high wind event when they dragged across the pipeline. And the fire on board has been contained, put out, but understand they need to get these containers off. Even though there may be no visible signs of fire, there may be fire within some of these containers. Radiated heat could spread to those containers. And so you need to get containers off. There was a vessel that was, uh, I did a whole video on it on the Express Pearl. And the Express Pearl was lost because of that. They had a fire on board and then they extinguished the fire, but then the fire rekindled. This is Express Pearl, uh, which was lost. Uh, vessel had a hazardous material leak on board, was denied permission to go into Oman and India, came to Sri Lanka, caught fire, put the fire out and then reignited. And then the vessel became a total loss, sank right off the coast, had huge environmental damage. And this is why we need to be careful with Zim Kingston. Even though the fire may be out and it appears everything's good, got to get that ship in, got to get those containers off now, especially off stacks three and five here, which are right next to the fire areas. And she had two other stacks that collapsed too. So I, the most important thing is to bring, it sounds like the weirdest thing in the world to bring in a ship that's on fire to dock, but you have to, to get these containers off. And understand ships can suffer catastrophic losses. Uh, great story here by Mike Schuler, uh, the worst container ship stat disasters in recent history. I'll have that under the story there. You can take a look at it, but th these need to be uh, feared as the MOL comfort. And what we've seen here is massive fires on vessels that can get out of control very quickly. And so you've got to be careful about that. And this bomb cyclone that's going to be off the coast, ships are being routed through it. They'd typically be routed around it, but again, because of the need to get the vessels on berth to offload, scheduled delays, Carriers are taking risks with vessels that we see all the time. And speaking of fires, I got a video coming out later this week, either Wednesday or Friday, not sure when I'm going to have it done by, which is going to talk about this fire on board Bonham Richard. Did videos early on. This is actually before I started doing as many videos as I'm doing now. I did two videos on the Bonham Richard fire. And so I want to really talk about that because I think it's a very significant event, especially the findings. Story number three, somebody's listening. I don't know who, but somebody's listening. Actually, I do know who, it's the mayor of Long Beach. So uh, I posted a couple of videos recently. Uh, one was using the, Mar uh, the Maritime Administration's Ready Reserve Force as a element of short sea shipping uh, in support of Ross Kennedy's idea. And then I posted a video on the five steps proposed by Ryan Peterson of Flexport of how to start putting a dent in the port congestion. And step number one was an initiative to be taken by Long Beach to allow stacking of empty containers higher. Right now they're at two, you can stack them two, but now they've given permission for four, maybe up to five in some areas. Uh, Ryan asked for six. Now I should also mention that we're, you know, permission is given to this right when a high wind event is about to happen. So uh, not sure when this is gonna go into effect or if we should wait until the high wind event passes. So there's not problems, but Again, I think it shows the success that you need some small elements here. It's not going to be, you know, the one magic, you know, pull the sword from the stone result. There's got to be a series of small little steps. And what we're seeing is some of those small steps are working. Uh, for example, the Port of Oakland is talking about opening up. Uh, Port of Oakland was their own worst enemy. Let me be clear about this. Port of Oakland, based on everything I've read and seen, did themselves in by having poor service poor reliability, issues with their labor, and a lot of carriers started to bypass the Port of Oakland and just come into LA and Long Beach. They have supposedly fixed that now. And so more carriers are starting to use the Port of Oakland as an alternative or a secondary port to offload. And what we're seeing is as, as, as LA, Long Beach, Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey are really dealing with these, these congestions, other U.S. ports are trying to take the load off them. We, we see that in Charleston. We see that in Virginia. We see it in Jacksonville. Now, that's good, but I should tell you that the big carriers, the big shipping companies, like to go into one port. It's more cost-effective for them. 
And there are some offers being made which are not really serious. Governor DeSantis made this plea that, hey, the ports of Florida are open, ready to take more cargo. That's great. And, and let me be clear, we need that kind of effort and, and using other ports will help. But the port of Miami, for example, which is the 10th largest container port in the United States, handles less than a million containers a year. The port of LA is moving about a million containers a month. Long Beach is moving about three quarters of a million containers a month. And, and then even if you go into Miami, you've got congestion then in Miami, you've got congestion now in Miami, I mean, let me be clear. But then you need more chassis, more drivers, more rail. And then you're in South Florida, you're five hours from the border. Even Jacksonville is a suitable port, but understand Jacksonville is a very small port. They have very small container terminal, very small container cranes. And some carriers use those ports exclusively. Dole, for example, uses Jacksonville. It's their source for bringing in fruits and vegetables. Why are there no banana shortage during all this? Because Dole ships go right into Jacksonville and they use it. So we're starting to see some changes being enacted, but we have to be careful about what changes we jump on. Story number four, I had an opportunity last week to go on Freight Waves, Steve Ferrer's B2B show. I was absolutely tickled to be asked by someone of Steve's caliber uh, to, to go on. We had a great discussion. Unfortunately, it's 30 minutes, so we're real tight on time, so we didn't get a chance to finish everything. But it was Steve who came up with this phrase, uh, container get." And it's being used quite a lot. He really missed the ball on uh, trademarking that term because it's a really good one. Uh, but one of the things we're seeing is it's not just impacting container trade, it's rolling over into other sectors. And I think it's really important that we don't fixate just on containers because it's very easy to do that. But if you had noticed, gas prices are going up, other, other prices are going up. And that's because we're seeing spillovers in other areas. And in particular, in this story from Reuters, which is on G Captain, container again drives sugar rice shippers back to the bulkers. Uh, in the past, we had seen a lot of that commodity go in containers. It was efficient, it was cheap, it was easy. But now bulk ships are getting that trade back again. And we're seeing sugar, coffee, rice, cotton, cocoa, you name it, shifting back into the bulk carriers. And that's gonna mean that bulk carriers are gonna increase in prices and that means their price is going to increase. And so we're seeing that happen right now. And, and so the bulk sector is about to see a big growth. We're gonna see that growth go on. And again, this is the dynamic growth we see in shipping. When one area gets kind of closed down, the other areas will, will alter to that. So we're seeing it with bulk carriers. We're also seeing it in tankers. Uh, this story by Splash uh, 24 seven, Sam Chambers over there, global merchant fleet tipped to have more LNG, liquefied natural gas carriers, then VLCCs, very large crude carriers, by as early as 2025, the world is shipping is changing its energy consumption. And oil is not going to be the big one. It's liquefied natural gas. And countries like Qatar uh, in particular, and other nations around the world, even the United States has become a huge LNG exporter, something we have not embraced in the maritime industry, even though we built LNG carriers in the 1970s and 1980s, one of the earliest to build them, we have not jumped onto it. And there's several reasons why that has happened. One of the reasons is we weren't sure how big LNG exports going to be. Now we know it's increased, now we know demand's increasing. And what we need to do is really get LNG ships built in the United States and used in this trade. It's gonna take time. And one of the things we should probably think about doing is bring in some LNG carriers that are built overseas, bring them in, put a slight tax per, I forget what the measurement is on liquefied natural gas, cubic meters, uh, a few cents, a few dollars, I don't know what the, the exact number would be, build up a, a coffer of money to help subsidize, to build ships in the United States, to get in this trade, but get American ships with American mariners out there to make sure that we are not dependent on foreign shippers, foreign carriers to get our LNG out there. And, and again, we don't wanna be 100%, it's, it's an impossible thing but it's a big industry we should be tipping into. But what we're seeing here is the alteration in bulkers and in the gas carriers. That is story number four. Story number five, I always like to pick a story that I think is really interesting, but may not get any attention at all. But I think, I think it's a substantial one. 
And it's this Sam Chambers story uh, from the Splash 24-7, UK set to announce big flag revamp. So British Merchant Marine was the dominant Merchant Marine for most of the industrial age. Uh, what built Great Britain into the major economic powerhouse it was, was its commercial fleet backed by the Royal Navy. You have the Royal Navy to defend the merchant fleet. That's why it existed. US Navy take lessons what the British did. When the British have finished their Brexit, they were under a lot of constraints under the European Union in terms of shipping. They had to open themselves up to uh, uh, basically foreign flag shipping in their coastal trade. Well, now they're getting ready to revamp this. The British Merchant Marine has fallen below uh, 20 in the world scale. We are 21, the United States. And so they want to enact changes. They want to basically put in place a incentive to get ships back under the, what they call the red duster. That's the flag right there. And so you see that now the British have some flags of convenience, Isle of Man, uh, another uh, Gibraltar in there and former British dominions, uh, 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 Malta, uh, not really dominion, but, but territory they controlled, Cyprus. Uh, but here is an effort by the British to do it. And they, you know, they talk about this, you know, the UK finance minister, the UK has always been a proud preeminent maritime nation with 90% of our trade and goods carried out by sea. Now we've left the EU. It's time for us to do even more to help the UK shipping industry to grow and compete in the global market. A big call by the British to get the British flag back out there. Really wish the US would follow suit. I, I can't lie. I'm, I'm a blatantly about that. I have no problem with that. And even in other areas we're seeing it, this is an announcement on Lodestar about Korean banks must offer ship leasing to help HMM fleet be competitive. Uh, Korean firms, Korean banking is down in financing their vessels. And they want the Korean government to either incentivize bankings to do this, you know, uh, domestic ship finance fallen from 22% in 2014 to 7.3%. In between there, a major Korean firm went bankrupt, Hanjin Marine, the seventh largest container firm in the world, went bankrupt. And so what they want is some support to do that. Uh, again, a lot of people will highlight that U.S. ships are more expensive, U.S. mariners are more expensive. But understand, a lot of these countries, Japan, Korea in particular, heavily subsidized, heavily finance their merchant fleets. And again, one of the things we want to be able to do is to operate in this international environment. But what we have done in the United States is deregulate, wash our hands of a lot of this. And that kind of leads us to where we are today, I would argue. Anyway, top five stories for October 25th, 2021. I hope you understand what the ship is going on now. And until next week, stay tuned. Be sure if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media. And if you can, please contribute to my Patreon page. You really do help. I mean, I'm serious. I, I'm getting a new microphone here that will be in service for my next broadcast uh, on this video from here. Uh, I'm also working on getting that sound balancer to prevent the audio issue I had on my previous issue. It does help and it does give me time and allows me to do these videos for you. So until next time, this is Sal signing off.